So, um, welcome to our panel discussion, I Will Keep Listening, Artist Books as Patient Narratives in the Classroom and Archives. Um, our panelists include Stella Balaki, who joins us all the way from University of Kent in Canterbury, England. Stella directs the postgraduate program in medical humanities. She's also the author of the book, Illness as Many Narratives, Arts, Medicine, and Culture. Uh, Kat Stefko is the Associate Librarian for Discovery, Digitalization, and Digi Digitization and Special Collections at Bowdoin College. A primary focus for Kat has been to increase access to the special collections, and she's done this at many institutions, including, including Harvard, Duke, Bates, and others. Sorry, I'm not doing you in order, guys. <laughs> Um, Marika Vand, okay, I'm going to get this right. <laughs> Marika Vander Steinhoven is the Special Collections Education and Outreach Librarian at Bowdoin College. She is an educator and advocate for experiential learning and has taught visual and performing arts in addition to her work in museums. We have our very own Jennifer Tuttle. Dorothy M. Healy, Professor of Literature and Health. Jennifer works to integrate the health sciences and the humanities here at UNE. She is currently working on a book titled Unsettling the Im Imperial Pacific, Pacific, American Nervousness in California Women's Writing, 1848 to 1915. And Kathleen Miller is curator of the Maine Women Writers Collection. Kathleen is working hard to bring the wonderful collection we have here at UNE into classrooms and facilitate student contact. She's done this for me in several of my classes with Martha Hall's books. Kathleen is also a poet, an herbalist, and a teacher. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, as um, um, Amy said, I come from the University of Kent uh, in England, and I've, it's been a great pleasure to work with Jennifer and Kathleen. Um, I want to um, focus my paper to um, talk about um, a project that we did together in collaboration with the Maine Women Writers Collection in Canterbury, where I live in 2016, um, which was a symposium and a workshop on artist books and the medical humanities. So we saw this very, very moving film featuring uh, Martha Hall. Um, and I want to um, talk to you a little bit about my own research on artist books and the medical humanities. Um, I was very pleased through the collaboration to bring Martha Hall's books uh, for the first time to a UK audience in 2016. And alongside that, um, I co-curated with a book artist an exhibition that featured uh, some other um, artist books uh, by um, UK and international uh, book artists as part of an exhibition that we called Prescriptions. I have with me uh, this little exhibition catalog for uh, anyone who would like to have a look uh, during the break. And I'm also showing many images um, today uh, from that exhibition. So I know that the other speakers will be focusing, or some of the other speakers of this panel will be focusing on Martha Hall's books. So I want to um, give you um, something uh, that relates to the other books that featured in that exhibition that are linked to the uh, themes of today's conference. So um, just very briefly, for anyone who is new to the artist book medium, um, it emerged in the 20th century as a radical format of bringing art to the wider public, and it's a medium that remains very much alive in the digital era. A very versatile medium that, as we saw from the film, combines text, image, and various methods of production, for example, photography, painting, drawing, stitching, collage, and so on. And what differentiates an artist's book uh, from the conventional book is that an artist's book integrates its themes or its aesthetic concerns with its formal means of realization, and more importantly, it engages readers physically through its tactility and materiality. So the artist's book is created for one-on-one -on -one interaction. It is created to be performed through handling, and that makes it uniquely accessible as opposed to the untouchable art object that is, for example, hanging on a gallery wall. Uh, one of the 
book scholars that I most admire, Johanna Dracker, is one of the most passionate advocates of this medium. She has suggested that the appeal of this form is what she has called its intimate authority. And I'm very much interested in this concept. There's much more to say about it, the way she describes it, but I'm more interested in putting it, uh, in putting this concept, intimate authority, in dialogue with illness narrative scholarship. And this is what my own work focuses on. I'm very much interested in the aesthetic and in the imaginative elements of illness communication. And what I've tried to do through um, that book uh, that Amy kindly mentioned, Illness as Many Narratives, is to open up the category of illness narrative and explore art forms beyond literature uh, that people and patients can use to communicate illness, uh, including uh, photography, artist books, performance, film, uh, animation, and even online narratives, which Hedy uh, uh, also mentioned. So um, what is it about um, the artist's book um, that we, we were trying to kind of showcase through this uh, project that I mentioned? The project, uh, as I said, consisted of an exhibition. Let me just show you a few images. That was the exhibition prescriptions. You can see the um, all the artists. Uh, who were featured there, um, and we also did, here's some um, photos from the gallery uh, in, as I said, it took place in Canterbury in, in an art gallery called the Beanie Art Museum. And we also did um, a workshop, very much like the workshop that Jennifer, Kathleen and Amy have prepared for tomorrow, uh, for health professionals, patients, members of the public. Uh, they all came together to make some artist books uh, uh, of their own. Um, some of these books, the, the artist books that we exhibited, are now part of our collection at the University of Kent, and I'm very, very pleased that they're going to be used with students, medical humanities students, creative writing students, and in the future with medical students, because the University of Kent is, is um, going to get a new, uh, its first, actually, medical school, so we're very pleased that we have this collection. So um, a few thoughts about how artist books um, can inform medical education and medical humanities. So through their expressive richness and their versatility, artist books can enhance the ways in which we think about and experience our bodies. As material artifacts, books mediate embodied experiences of illness more directly than illness narratives. If you think about words like skin, spine, and joints, these may refer to both the body of the book, but also um, the, bo sorry, the, the human body. So many of the works that we included in the exhibition prescription, prescriptions use the book and its elements as a metaphor for the body or as metaphors for particular kinds of illness. For example, an open yet frozen book was used by Ashley Fitzgerald to corporealize a rare condition of the nervous system in this work entitled GBS, standing for Guillain Barre syndrome. Um, in another book, and I'll be, I'm sorry that I'm moving fast, showing you lots of images, but uh, hopefully the messages will become clear. This is a book by Lisanne van Essen, a sculptural book entitled Osteoporosis, and as you can see, it exhibits the characteristic holy appearance of osteoporotic bone to display rather than inform about this condition. Artist books can also bear the body's marks, its scars, and hold its traces through the inclusion of body scans, pathology lab bags, and even fingerprints and hairs into their multi-textured matter. And this is true as well of Martha Hall's books. They do include many of these traces. And what is interesting about these objects is that they do not merely function as signs, but they have a material presence. So they return us to their embodied use by the people they belong to, and therefore invite us to attend, and that's another word that Hedy um, mentioned in the importance of attention, invite us to attend to our own embodied experience when we touch and handle these books. One of the most moving books from prescriptions was The Unfinished 
blanket. This is the actual blanket the artist, Erin Schmidt, started making for her baby before her miscarriage interrupted it. And we heard this morning another story about the, uh, the loss of, of a baby, uh, the termination of a pregnancy. So here, uh, in this particular textile book, the pink ribbons that we see untie, allowing the reader access to the text that appears at three very different points throughout the pregnancy and the book. So the excitement of anticipation as the blanket is begun eventually leads to the discovery of a red, lumpy, crocheted form that represents the bleeding and a growing mass of tissue. This can be moved aside if when you're handling the book to reveal a small book of silk showing an ultrasound image which indicates there, that there are no viable babies visible anymore. In fact, there were two babies um, that, got mis mis uh, that, that she was expecting. Um, illness as a journey is a dominant way of representing illness experience, but non-linear or open-ended narratives are better suited to some experiences, for example, chronic illness. Artist books can capture lived experiences of illness in a very palpable way. For example, here in Anne Parfit's Diary of an Illness, we can see what waiting for diagnosis and treatment feels like. This book consists of repeated sequential drawings. Each drawing, as the, as the artist herself describes it, is an imitation of the previous, yet never identical mirroring the indistinguishable yet unique nature of each moment. So this book retains the sequential regularity. There, there is a sequence to it, as, as is our experience of most books. This is a key structural feature of the book form, but this book refuses closure. And in this way, Parfit expands our awareness of the complexity of certain illness experiences, especially chronic illness, that resist an established form of narration. It resists, in this case, closure. It doesn't end. So the focus on the ever-present or the enduring nature of illness here also reveals that patients rarely constitute the temporality of illness in the same way as their physicians. Now, clinicians, scholars, and members of the public have privileged particular types of evidence and ways of presenting or sharing knowledge about health. Uh, we have third-person reports, medical data, and illness representations that emphasize linearity, coherence, and closure. But we know that this is not the case with all illness experiences. And again, Heidi mentioned earlier something that I really like, data with a soul. And I think that's what we need. And often we get that from storytelling and from artist books. So um, artist books through their intimate authority can counter the kinds of injustices um, that patients often face, what philosopher Javi Carroll has called epistemic injustice. It's a term that she hasn't coined, but she's using it to think about health and what happens to patients uh, um, and, and the kinds of knowledge that patients have. So even when books address the invisibility and the depersonalizing experience of being a patient, they, they still generate knowledge. Um, here, for her book, Unknown, which was part of a live performance, sorry, I'm not showing you the right image, here it is, Carol Kluwer considered the number of people diagnosed with breast cancer in the same year as her, and that was 45,704 people in 2004. So what she did in her book, here you see the book, the book simply consists of pages and pages of identical-looking, hand-drawn, gold-threaded grids of blue dots based on the measurement grids and tattoos used when one has radiotherapy. And we also saw Martha Hall uh, reading through her um, tattoo book uh, earlier in the film. So in this book, each one of these dots represents one person anonymous like her. And the book is aptly entitled Unknown. So this book makes us feel beyond what we can merely see. And here, what we feel is the artist's attempt to connect with other cancer patients through this very particular creative aesthetic intervention. And a similar book is uh, that relies on repetition is Prescriptions, 
a set of embossed prints that represents the amount of pills taken during Lizzie Brewer's, the artist's, five years of her breast cancer treatment. Martha Hall also has a book called Prescriptions, which you will be able to see uh, in the exhibition uh, later on this evening. Dominant metaphors in medical education, such as the body as machine, perpetuate the dehumanizing and objectifying aspects of medical care. And what I find interesting about artist books is that they can disperse the medical gaze by opening up the idea of the body as traditionally understood by biomedicine. So artist books can help reignite a sense of wonder and mystery when it comes to confronting our body's materiality. And there were plenty of examples of that in uh, prescriptions. So uh, what do you think this is? Can anyone guess what this is? What you're looking at? Any ideas? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it's interesting. Did you mention apples initially? Yeah, that, that's what I get as a response. But actually, this, these are arthroscopies of knees, but they are so similar, as you say, to a lunar landscape. And this is a book by Veronique Chance called In the Absence of Running. Uh, so she uh, that explores injury that happens to the knee and she created those lovely books where she's putting together all these different uh, arthroscopies of knees. And then there were other books. Here is a book um, called On Innards that embodies through its multitude of folds the intestines. And the book is held together by a mesenteric binding which when unwound allows the book to be fully experienced by the reader. And the final example is this book, uh, one of my favorites, by Julie Brixey Williams calls, called Rosebud, a bookwork created after reading the entire tale of the sleeping beauty into an anesthetic machine that drew the breathing patterns as a series of flow loop waveforms. And then another book called Body Map that uh, is a very unconventional map of a woman's body um, with lots of text around it uh, that explores personal um, stories, th this particular artist's own experiences of her body, as well as information about environment, environmental hazards. So what all of these books have in common is that they can re-enchant uh, stories and illness because they invest in alternative images that fall outside the strictly uh, clinical framework. Another interesting thing about artist books is the slow movement through which they have to be handled, um, which can become a metaphor for the kind of gentle care a patient may want. However, this dimension of artist books also adds a ritualistic element to the act of reading and creates a space for a contemplative experience. And in prescriptions, we had books that explored that aspect of meditation and mindfulness. So here we see two books, No Mind by Gabby Gardeners, that contains uh, almost two meter long ink calligraphy script repeating the words No Mind, a Zen expression equivalent to being present. And you also see, um, here in Like Weather by Amanda Watch and Will, a flag book that, exp that actually uh, thematizes mindfulness because it highlights the changeable nature of our moods, drawing on the Buddhist idea of the mind as a cloudy sky. So the artist said that she created this book because she wanted uh, to, um, to, it helped her reinforce uh, mindfulness. Um, so in the specific context of healthcare, where routine and impersonal interactions frequently turn professionals into automatons, such a space, often silent, where awareness and presence can be restored is essential. And what's interesting about artist books, we heard a lot about reflective writing, is that artist books can also be used as a means of reflection, a reflection that doesn't only rely on words, but engages both the mind and the body. And it can rely on repetition, as we saw from the previous books, uh, uh, and very mindful um, activities. I also wanted to show you a book that uh, was created uh, at the workshop, and this was um, um, 
a book created by a nurse, someone teaching nursing, nursing uh, uh, in nursing studies. And what she did is she created a book of pages, each with an outline of an identical human hand, cut from different materials, including sandpaper, fabrics, newsprint, and embossed and glossy papers. And when we asked her about why she wanted to create this book, she said that hands are such an important part of nursing care, but physical contact has been reduced to a bare minimum. So she really wanted to highlight the importance of touching through this, through the artist book medium, and how it can it can really redress the emphasis currently placed on technology with medical uh, interactions. So I want to conclude. Um, Meanwhile, you can see the website where you can find more information about the symposium and the workshop, and see many more images. So I want to conclude with a statement made by medical humanities critics Anne Whitehead and Angela Woods in a recently published volume called The Edinburgh Companion to the Critical Medical Humanities. They ask the following question with respect to the clinical encounter between doctor and patient, and they say, what else is in the room, for example, the examination room, and with what forms of, or modes of agency might it be associated? Um, they ask in particular, how might we account for non-human objects and presences in the clinical setting? So not just pay attention to the doctor and the patient in the room, but for example, the atmosphere and anything around them, objects and non-human presences. Now, in response to that question, I would say that the book as object has agency. And as we saw in, uh, in the film featuring Martha Hall, in the case of her interactions with the medical community, her books allowed her to bridge the distance, literally, as her doctor and she had to draw their chairs closer to read one of the books together in the consultation room. So the book placed between doctor and patient becomes an intimate space of connection in the here and of complete immersion in the now. It is my hope now that the prescriptions books are in the special collections at Kent that we'll be able, me and other colleagues will be able to place these books in front of our students and explore with them the joys and the provocations that they open up for them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stella. That, this is a tough act to follow. Don't you agree? Let's see. All right. How I, do I do this? What do I do? This? You guys got to help me out. I don't want to hit the wrong button. I'm not a Mac user, so I'm like, oh, this is a very strange foreign planet. Same thing I did. Thank you. Okay. What did I say earlier about how IT makes everything else possible? Thank you very much, Lee. <laughs> Let's see. All right. <laughs> Martha Hall's artist book, Voices, Five Doctors Speak, documents a span of 10 days in which Martha spoke with five doctors about her second recurrence of breast cancer. The book captures the nuances of communication with each practitioner by assigning each a different font. Composed entirely of doctors' statements, voices is an adamant expression of the patient's voice that forces the reader to occupy her position as she sifts through her physician's words and tends to their impact on her psyche. Commenting on voices in the documentary film, I Make Books, which many of you viewed earlier today, Martha reveals how she brought the book to the feature's doctor's offices and asked to discuss it. And only one resisted doing so repeatedly, so as you know if you saw the film, Martha forced the issue. I said, she recounts, 
I'm going to be giving a talk on my books, and somebody's going to ask me, because they always do, have all the doctors seen this book? And I'm going to say no. Thus chastened, her physician relented, and they read the book together, but only as Stella just told you. After Martha insisted that he come out from behind his desk on the opposite side of the room, you're going to sit next to me and we're going to look at it, she demanded, and he complied. This episode, involving the insistent, even angry patient, her book, and her reluctant doctor, in many ways encapsulates the power and purpose of Martha's work on her breast cancer experience. Her books demand conversation, especially with healthcare practitioners, performing a gesture equivalent to commandeering her doctor's office and directing him to sit with her, to listen to her voice, but also to engage in a dialogue as equals. Martha's work thus exemplifies artist books' unique potential to instill in healers what Rita Sharon calls narrative competence, the ability to absorb, interpret, and respond to stories, and to hone the empathy, compassion, and ethics that uh, healthcare practitioners will need in their practice. Health-related artist books by patients not only privilege the patient's perspective, but require visual, tactile, emotional engagement on the part of the reader. As Stella has argued here and elsewhere, they foreground materiality, mimicking a physical examination, and requiring, as Johanna Drucker has observed, that readers spend time with them. Martha has stated, oops, oh good, never mind, it's fine. She stated that her books are, quote, a means to affect change in the way medical professionals interact with their patients. She made a conscious investment in this dialogue when she chose the Maine Women Writers Collection here at UNE as a repository for her work, knowing that we would, as she put it, make her work accessible to the audience she most wanted to reach. Open to the public, the Maine Women Writers Collection is a non-circulating special collection and archives of rare uh, and unique material related to women's cultural production in and about Maine. Among many populations that we serve are UNE students whose professors integrate our materials into the curriculum. We therefore spend a good deal of time putting Martha's books into the hands of readers who, while not necessarily reluctant, did not actively seek them out. As curator and director of the Maine Women Writers Collection, Kathleen and I work in tandem to achieve the collection's outreach goals and deliver its educational content. And our experiences with Martha's books illustrate the particular value of humanity's archival collections, especially artist books, to health sciences education. So we have time today to offer a mere glimpse of this work. I'll spend the remains of my time talking about my experiences using the books in my own English courses, where I have had the privilege to share them with students for over 10 years. Students are unfailingly moved by Martha's work, and they always get a lot of time to handle the books in class. I put equal emphasis, however, on the writing that students do afterward, taking up Martha's challenge of conversation. As when she says in the film, I make books, that she would love to hear back from UNE students who read her work. Their responses comprise formal research papers, as well as free rights, journal entries, uh, letters to Martha, uh, which she very much cherished, and then after her death, letters to her family. And having taken emotional risks as readers of Martha's books, students tend to use the in-class writing to process their personal experiences, to articulate their feelings about illness, and to speak openly about taboo subjects such as death. They often say that the books give them practical information, otherwise inaccessible to them, about illness experiences of friends and family. But they also thank Martha for giving them a language to externalize and articulate their emotions. 
I dream to find my own way through feelings of breast cancer, one student writes, proceeding to weave lines of Hall's work into a kind of poem on the page. Another student used her in-class writing time to compose two original poems and then brought her parents to the collection uh, to share Martha's books with them, which I just found incredibly exciting. Students frequently use their letters to Martha as occasions to reflect upon the implications of exposure to her books for health professions education. A typical but unusually lyrical example illuminates how Martha's work reminds students of patient subjectivity and of the dehumanizing experience of clinical encounters. I work in a busy ER, this student confesses, where it's easy to forget that bodies are lives. Everyone looks the same when dressed in Johnny's and Goosebumps. Martha teaches these students that artist books are a valid means, among many, of getting at the truth of a patient's experience. Students learn that while Martha's books might look and feel different from traditional scientific textbooks, they are of equal heft. Martha stated that her ultimate goal was to achieve a more patient-centered medical practice in which dialogue is a central part of the interaction between patient and healer. And we have sought to take up where she left off, and a narrative approach has been central to that work. Among its many achievements, perhaps most important is that the exercise of having students write about her books normalizes engaging in dialogue with patients and normalizes considering and even centering patients' voices. Thank you. Um, so what I would like to highlight today in my remarks is the distinct power of Martha Hall's voice and the uniqueness of these books as stories about illness. I have the opportunity to work with a wide range of classes who use Martha's book to explore narrative, form, color, structure, and other elements of the artist's book. I have handled Martha's books more times than I can count. I have watched the film of her speaking about her books every semester for the past eight years without, um, sorry, at least once, um, without fail. Each time I handle these books, each time I watch Martha speak about her work, each time I watch a new group of students engage with her books, I am moved by the power that these books hold. As Jennifer already noted, Martha Hall specifically asks for dialogue with the readers of her work. While this is implicit in the reading experience, there's a dialogue between reader and writer when you hold a book in your hands and turn the pages. Martha's request from her readers is more demanding. She asks us to speak the impact of these books on our psyches and on our hearts. She holds us to the same standard to which she held her doctors. I want you to listen and I want to know what you think. How does she do this in books that were made over a decade ago? How does she continue to hold us wrapped despite, despite the fact that we will never be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with her as an artist? It is the power of her story, the vulnerability that she exposes in her book's pages, the vulnerability that we share with her as humans in bodies that could fail us at any moment. I am struck by the story Martha told in the film about having to make books on a theme for a book arts class and how she had chosen sailing because she did not want to make books about cancer. When she finally broke down and realized that she had to make books about her cancer experience, this is when she exposed herself most fully as an artist. When we are at our most vulnerable, we are at our most powerful, at least when we consider power in the form of connecting our experience with others. If Martha had continued to make books about sailing, they would have been lovely books, I'm sure. But they would not be books that we ache to put in the hands of readers into the hands of future healthcare professionals. Martha's books tell a story that most people are afraid to tell. They open the books, sorry, they. <laughs> 
They open the biggest wounds a person might experience in life for everyone to peer in. They shepherd us through living with the fear of dying. They teach us to tell our own difficult stories and to open up those walled off places that keep us separate from one another. I can feel the change in the room when students' own walls break down. Some students walk around the tables barely looking at or reading anything. Some students are looking with clinical eyes at these stories. Usually though, at some point in that one to two hour period, some student is deeply affected by Martha's story. There are often tears and tissues offered. What happens in those moments is that the students in the room become quiet, listening, offering more to the moment and to each other. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, the room becomes a community of humans trying to figure out how to hold the hardships of life together. It would be easy to stay in sadness in these moments, but Martha's voice pulls us out of that space too. She invites us to emphasize the word living as we read her words. Until the end of her life, it is clear from her words and her choices that Martha Hall was a fighter. She leaves with us an incredible legacy in the stories she tells in these books. She engages us as readers to ask and asks us to create just relationships, spaces of true listening, and to imagine ourselves into the edges of fear and anxiety that accompany the experience of living with life-threatening illness. These books will continue to offer a great gift to our students because Martha speaks to her readers so honestly and shares not only the painful aspects of her experience, but also her humor and her humanity. Her books are her legacy, and we are her stewards. It seems fitting to close with Martha's words rather than my own, because, because it is the way that she tells her story, with awareness of the inevitability of death in each word that makes her voice so enduring. The following passage from the book Support Group reminds me of how we walk away from our experience of engaging with Martha Hall's books. Quote, we know something about each other before we even meet. Our stories are the same, yet terribly different. And what we take out into the dark night is secret, but newly colored by what others have said, disclosed. Thank you. is working. So thank you all for um, being here and I wanted to thank my fellow panelists for including Marika and myself as part of this discussion. Um, we're here to kind of offer I think a real case study in terms of how Martha Hall's works are being read and being heard at um, a small liberal arts college. So unlike what UNE has by way of um, opportunities to insinuate um, works from Martha into the curriculum. Bowdoin is a little bit different in terms of being a liberal arts college. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about that and what that might mean. I think that we'll get a little bit at what Hetty was talking about in terms of leadership as well as the medical arts. So um, my, my role um, is easy. Um, I'm, I really want to just set the stage, and Marika's going to do the hard part, so that's the way we really divide work at my shop. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a few points I really want to make, which is about sort of at the heart why Martha Hall's works matter to Bowdoin, um, to what the college does, to what the library does, and to what our students do and what we hope they'll do. So um, what you should know is that Bowdoin, thanks in large part to the generosity of the Hall family, has a large and important collection of Martha Hall's works. And that's not only her finished works, um, we have about 33 of those, but we also have her personal papers. 
And through individual works and the collective whole, we are presented with an opportunity, and I would actually say a responsibility, to tell and retell her story. They're held in Martha's works are part of my department, um, which is Special Collections and Archives. And for those of you not familiar with that, that's part of the library. Like the main women's writers collection, um, our mission is to support the educational work of the college. And we do this by collecting, disseminating, preserving, and interpreting primary materials, rare books, and special materials, such as artist books. We have about 440 in our collection. And um, I think probably the largest collection in the state of Maine, thanks to my predecessor who began it in the 1990s. So to understand why Hall's works matter to Bowdoin, I think it's important that you understand what matters to Bowdoin. We are a liberal arts college dedicated to creating an environment that allows students to take intellectual risks and to be fearless. We want them to consider ideas and materials that challenge their points of view and we want them to appreciate diversity in all of its manifestations. And we want them to care deeply, not just for one another, but for the world around them. So in short, what Bowdoin aims to do is produce not just graduates, but citizens. Given the topic of today's symposium, I really do want to take a moment to just mention how we deal with medical education. Um, there's no pre-med track at Bowdoin College. Um, as our advisor for health professions recently said, and I love this quote, I hate the notion of a track. It suggests a conveyor belt, and too bad if you fall off. So instead at Bowdoin, students are encouraged to find their own story and their own pathway to medical school or the medical professions. Students are encouraged to explore their own interests while learning to think critically and analytically, listen to and collaborate with others, synthesize large masses of information, develop cultural competencies, ask good questions, and most importantly, empathize. So the library and special collections within it plays a critical role in educating Bowdoin students. We aim to teach them the skills they need to be effective learners, researchers, and writers. We do that in a number of ways, but especially through our instruction program, which Marika will speak about in some detail. While traditionally library instruction, and many of you probably lived through this, um, emphasized dry recitation of facts, we have moved on, and today we really aim to actively engage students in looking, thinking, and caring through exposure to materials, ideas, and stories beyond their own. Artist books, oh, I meant to show you this. The offer of the college, which sort of encapsulates what matters to Bowdoin. And I'll give you a moment to read that. Don't miss the part about the library. So artist books, such as Martha's Tattoo, which was the first one that came into both special collections from Martha. Um, so artist books are among the most compelling objects to advance the objectives of our instruction program. And I don't think I need to defend that point of view after the excellent presentations that preceded me. I will also say we find that Martha Hall's books are among our most powerful examples in our collection. They're compelling for their strong writing, their technical daring, their structural complexity, their art artistic mastery, and yes, their narrative. The sum of her works, and we have the benefit of having her first book in the, our collection, as well as some of her last, and together they're able to, they allow us to tell the remarkable development of this woman as a visual artist. By pairing her finished works with her papers, we also reveal her journey through successive and successful careers. So not only was she an amazing book artist, but she was an executive, an entrepreneur, a mother, and yes, a cancer patient. Our experience both interacting with students and as caretakers of these materials tell us firsthand about the power of Hall's works to inspire the reader. At Bowdoin, as Bowdoin seeks to educate the next generation of healthcare 
providers, and in fact leaders in all fields, Hall's work served to remind us that the journey is as important as the destination. Hall made, works, Hall made books to make sense of her world, and our aim is for students to read those books and to help make sense of their own worlds and to inspire them in their own journeys of discovery. Thank you. So building on what Kat, the uh, framework that Kat provided, thank you, <laughs> um, at Bowdoin in their special collections um, and archives instruction program emphasizes active learning for information, archival, and visual literacy. We work with faculty from across all disciplines to meet a wide variety of learning goals and to support teaching with our unique materials. Our emphasis on active learning places the student at the center of our instruction design, providing the opportunity to engage in hands-on learning to build transferable skills that directly promote students' academic growth and development. Artist books are incredible teaching tools for student-centered active learning. Their form demands engagement, and when works are well ex executed, it forces students to confront what preconceived notions they have about the book form and the act and performance of reading and how each influences the transmission of knowledge. Artist books inherently encourage students and all readers to consider how form influences content and vice versa. When I design instruction sessions around artist books, there may be a bit of introductory material, a few words about handling the books, and perhaps I'll offer some guiding questions. But mostly, it is giving students the space and the time to engage with the work. But who is using the artist book collection at Bowdoin? The nature of Martha Hall's work in its form and contact, content excuse me, organically insinuates itself across the curriculum. So what I want to offer you now are a few examples of where and how Hall's work is being integrated into the curriculum at Bowdoin. In the visual arts department, students engage with Hall's work in advance of creating their own artist books. They examine her work for its format and construction, and they consider the interplay between content and form. In the biology department, students in a course entitled Cancer Biology, which is a class that is dedicated to understanding the biological basis of cancer and that examines diagnostic procedures and explores emerging technologies that are developing new treatments based on cancer cell characteristic, spend a lab session engaging with Hall's books and consider the human implications of their studies and engage in discourse on the relationship between science and art. In the art history department, recently there was a course entitled Art and Catastrophe, which explored visual responses to loss, trauma, and cultural catastrophe. Throughout the semester, students considered how artistic traces of suffering offer insight into ruptures so painful that they linger beyond the limitations of their linear narrative and along the fringes of cognition. The class was structured to bring together disparate works of art, including film, photography, video, sculpture, performance, the graphic arts, and curatorial practice as a means of exploring the possibilities and limits of representation. We'll be hearing later on from Maeve, who was a student in that course and who engaged with a project on Martha Hall's books. And finally, another example, and these are just four examples, um, is coming out of the history department. A new first year seminar entitled Health Histories visits special collections, actually they haven't come yet, they're coming next month, to engage with Hall's work. This course examines the histories, cultural, political, and scientific, th through which what constitutes healthy individuals and health societies have come to be understood. This course was developed out of the Health, Culture, and Society faculty cohort, which is a group that is thinking about what academic offerings at Bowdoin can support and strengthen the liberal arts pathway to careers in the medical and health fields. So 
this is how we in Special Collections and Archives at Bowdoin are facilitating, and again, just some brief examples, um, facilitating the use of our collection of Martha Hall's work. But what I really want to leave you with is how encountering and studying Hall has impacted our students. What I think you will see reflected in these comments is mirrored in the offer of the college that Kat presented and um, our goals for Bowdoin students. I will read these for you. I kept, and, and these are reflections and, and part of the reflective writing practice that we do in almost all of our um, course instruction. Um, this was written after the students visited and spent a class session with Hall's work. I kept thinking about these artist books as really succinct sonnets. Their concern for posterity, their intricacies that the viewer reader must unfold. It is the viscerality of these objects that is so effective in creating affect I keep thinking about the book with handprints, about numbness. I have also found myself thinking, what constitutes art? Our discussion of Hall's books elevates them into some kind of discourse. Another reflection. I was touched by the books we saw in special collections. Their subject matter struck deep within me, really making me reflect on my own life. I called both sets of grandparents later that day. There was something so amazing, visceral, jolting, moving about handling these books. I cannot even describe how it felt. The experience in class and our ability to use these amazing resources enhances my learning in extraordinary ways. Although they are difficult to handle, I am very grateful to have this experience add to my education. I, I couldn't whittle this. I actually did whittle this down to four, so there's two more coming. <laughs> It was engrossing to feel Hall's artist books, not to read them necessarily, but to feel them, to run the material of the page around my fingers, to listen for the sharp crinkle of certain fabrics. Even the less than obvious way of opening one of these books or closing it was an experience that both transcended and built upon the nature of a book. And finally, looking at Martha Hall's books, book, brought forth so many existential questions for me, especially after seeing the artist's author in video. I found myself asking if her quality of life, struggling every day with painful illnesses, illness, medications, and invasive procedure is worth living at all. These questions were further complicated when I saw a video of her, apparently cheery, reading her own work and describing personal stories. It made me realize the importance of perspective, outlook, and how a positive one eliminates any such questions because of course life is always worth living. Her books are moving and meaningful and I loved having the opportunity to view them. Thank you. So if we have questions for the panelists, we'd love to take them now. Actually, I was um, moved to think about the AIDS quilt after listening to all the stories. Um, I was involved for about 12 years and so met the caregivers, the other, the other end, but the images, the texture, you know, beyond, I mean, it's so sensuous, you know, and on so many levels. And so that took me by surprise uh, when you uh, started talking about um, it, that it's also the feel um, as well as the words and the, the combination of everything. And I think the quilt, uh, the name's Project Quilt, um, did the same thing for people, um, made by caregivers. Yeah. Other questions? Does um, Hall talk at all about where she gets the paper for some of her books? Um, does she make it herself? Um, and then some of the imprints, does she make the stamps for those? So I'm wondering if any of the papers, in any of her papers she has, like the provenance of where some of these materials are coming from, and if they have meaning for her. Hello. Ooh. 
Hello. Um, so in her personal papers at Bowdoin, there's actually a large series of materials that's called Materials and Ideas, um, where there's a lot of documentation about the various paper making workshops that she attended. So she did make paper. She experimented with all kinds of creative processes around that. Um, she also did a lot of work to watercolor and dye and otherwise alter paper. I think this was um, perhaps because of her fiber arts background that she was particularly interested in the materiality of paper. So I think that there's a lot of um, interesting work that's still to be done around her work with paper. In terms of stamps, she did make her own. Um, she was a maker. I mean, that, that wasn't a term being used back then, but I think she was very much interested in production, handmade production of elements. And it was only later when, um, when uh, her use of her own hands became more challenging that she started having her books letter pressed, letter press printed. I don't know if anybody wants to add. Just to build on that last point, I, I, I find it fascinating to think about uh, the ways in which, and I do think this is one reason why, again, the archives as a source for these educational materials are so valuable because not only because many of us knew Martha and spoke with her about this stuff, um, not only because in the in the personal papers, uh, the ephemera, there's documentation of her process, uh, but also you know uh, it, it's fascinating to think about the fact that. Um, so much of what she's saying in her books and exploring in her books is evidenced through the books, the, the material choices, uh, even down to the fact that, for example, she said, you may remember at the beginning of the film, it opens with her reading and turning the pages of a very large red book called I Make Books, and she says, I make books so I won't die. And she said once uh, to me, I think it was during the process of making the film, the reason that the pages are so big is that I, I can note the treatment for my cancer means I can no longer feel the tips of my fingers. I cannot work with s small, delicate pieces anymore. Um, and there are other examples like that, but it's just a fascinating uh, and very moving aspect of her work, you know, that even when um, and so, so it, you know, the choice to use pre-made materials or materials made by others, you know, it's a very complicated one with a and very interesting context. I just wanted to comment that it's so moving to me that I have this image of students engaging in a tactile way with the books that this is not about putting books in a library or a museum. There's so much museum stuff, and I love museums, but this is different. This is engaging. You're feeling it, you're seeing it, you're experiencing it. What a legacy. I, I, I mean, it's just remarkable just thinking about that at both schools. The other thing I wanted to mention that I've been thinking about is we've got a whole set of women sitting up here in the panel, and a lot of women sitting back here, what about men's narratives and men's artist books? And where can we go to try and help men feel comfortable to express in the written word or in an artistic way? Um, I think there's a real issue with that culturally, and I'm living with it. You know, my husband has actually done some writing, which is remarkable because we laughed that he could never do any writing before he was ill. And we actually joked with his neurosurgeon and said, what did you do? Because now he's writing essays. Um, you develop morbid humor when you deal with this stuff. But I think he's in the minority from what I can see. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. It's working. It's, just, uh, it's really interesting what you mentioned about women. And I mean, about artist books, one thing I'm going to say is I was very interested in, I think I mentioned that scholar Johanna Drucker talking about artist books. 
And she, um, she's, um, she's written this lovely essay from where I borrowed that concept, intimate authority, and she's talking about why this particular medium has been historically preferred, you know, uh, by women. And one of the things she says, I mean, she's making all the associations that artist books have with sewing and crafts and, and letter writing, the kinds of activities that historically have been associated with women's creativity. But then she's also saying something very interesting to me, and that's where she's exploring this idea of intimacy. She talks about how artist books um, balance uh, a need for enclosure uh, and a need for exposure. So she's talking about the both the private and the public dimension that any book has. It's something that you can close, put away, it's private, but you can also share it. You're sharing it uh, with one person at a time, unlike, say, um, a painting or something that is hanging in, in a wall and it's kind of right there in your face. And I think that there's something quite interesting about that, about that whether there is something about artist books that taps into women's desire to, um, to um, uh, get that sense of authority from a very intimate kind of medium. Having said that, in this exhibition catalog there are artist books made by men who explore experiences of illness, all sorts. Uh, I mean, they are in the minority, but uh, there are examples even in that medium and there, there are many book artists who are doing that. But I think you're absolutely right. There are uh, so very fewer men. I mean, it was again interesting to me that the workshop that we did in Canterbury, everyone, I don't think there was a single man there who... who except the instructor who signed up for that. And it was just, you know, it was 30 or so women and it was something that we were also reflecting on. You know, what does this mean? And is this a comment on, uh, you know, creativity or, you know, not being open to those kinds of creative expression or does it have, does it have to do uh, with health and exploring, you know, telling your narrative of illness? Uh, is it harder on men to do that? And what kind of stories do they say? I think that's a really important question. Just very quickly, um, something for all of us to be thinking about, not only in undergraduate medical education or regular education, but within cancer institutes and hospitals where there are medical humanities groups, how do we encourage men and women to be partaking in the benefits of medical humanities? It's something to think about. I just want to uh, um, that I think your question kind of made me think about Sherry's keynote address where she talked about, you know, the, she talked about it as the divine feminine, but I think about what she was really getting at, you know, is, is that the masculine energy in our society, in our culture is cut off from the heart so often and that that is how men are socialized and, and how even the most sensitive and, and you know, thoughtful men have a really hard time getting to a place of being able to expose. So like it's a cultural condition, right? The cultural illness <laughs> that, you know, how do we create spaces of safety where everyone feels like they can be vulnerable and still be strong because I think really there most of us don't want to tell our stories. I have a question from Marika. You mentioned the um, the class um, the cancer of biology and the students looking at the books in that class. Were they, were they doing any writing attached to just looking through or I was just curious how that Played out. So the first interaction was um, facilitated by Kat's predecessor, and I believe that they just were looking at the books, and then there was a discussion. Mm -hmm. So generally, in our instruction sessions, it's there's looking, discussion, and then written reflection. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with them later on this semester. So there will be a written component, but it has yet to happen again. So the first the first iteration of it did not. No. Yeah. Other questions. Or comments. Hello. Um, as a student who's seen this documentary twice now and um, touched Martha Hall's books, 
and experience them. And actually, I cried the first time that we had a discussion about them. It's very emotional. You'll experience it. But um, so I'm an undergraduate student now, and my goal is to attend medical school. And my question for you is, should these books be part of a medical school curriculum? And if so, um, what do you think the differences would be between an undergraduate student looking at these and a medical student looking at these? Thank you, Kaylee. I think she's ready for medical school. Yeah, you should just be going now, right? You're ready. I, I, really, I cannot sufficiently answer your question. It's a great one. Um, but I'll just say first, yes, I think they should be part of medical education. I think they have so much to offer. And, um, you know, I think we hope that having them at UNE, and I know, Bowden, you talked about how you have a kind of similar uh, beautiful liberal arts college groundwork for this, right, is that, um, that they're certainly available for students to kind of return to if they are exposed to them as undergrads and then they come back. Um, having the College of Osteopathic Medicine here on campus, of course, um, is a wonderful opportunity for us. And, you know, Unicom has been really supportive of this event today. I think that as time goes by, they're more and more aware of the resources that we have. You know, I, I don't know very much about the intricacies of medical education, but I'll just say I imagine that um, it's really, and my sense from talking with them, with them about, in fact, this very question in the last 10 years uh, the, a challenge for them is, right, how do I make room for this in my curriculum? And that's nothing I can help them with, you know. Um, but it's an excellent question. If I could just add, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say quickly that the difference between looking at the books from an undergrad perspective and, a, and a, a, someone in medical school, I think undergrads are so idealistic and they end up coming at the medical education um, perspective with heart and then we end up in medical school for a long time and there's sort of the all the science layers in and these books I think would help to bring the medical students back down to heart. I will just quickly also add, the first time I encountered an artist book was as an undergraduate student, and it, and it was one of those, it was a, one of those pivotal moments for me, right? This experience of turning the page. Um, and I'm fully immersed in the humanities, and again, not qualified to talk about right, how artist books would insinuate into the medical school experience, but I did just want to share that, right, for me, I encountered them as an undergraduate, and this is an experience that I carried through a very different type of graduate program and a, and a whole career to kind of circle back to them. Um, and one of the things that we're hoping to do by introducing artist books through our first year seminars at the undergraduate level, right, is to introduce those experiences early on to, I think, building on what Jennifer said to kind of build that experience into the individual student and so you carry that with you and so you bring that with you so of course I think I agree yes they should be there but um, to kind of offer that perspective too I was just gonna say that I think there's we're really missing an opportunity when so much of healthcare today is interdisciplinary and I can't help but think UNE would have a perfect opportunity where you have a pharmacy school, uh, a medical school, a nursing program to actually bring the interdisciplinary team together to uh, explore artist books. I have to tell you, I, I've been a nurse for 45 years and have spent it all in the world of critical care. I've never heard of such a thing. And I find myself very moved thinking about the impact that delirium has on our patients in the critical care environment and how it affects them for years to come. And I'd love to see an opportunity for patients to have the ability to express that 
through, for example, an, an artist's book. But if the team doesn't understand that there is such a thing as artist books and the relief that that can provide for a patient and or a family and the impact that that can have on the team, I, I mean, this is just an enormous opportunity. And uh, so I'm, I'm just blown away. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you. for that incredible comment. And I, um, we're going into the break, so we need yeah. to stop. But I, can I just, um, do you want us to spend 30 seconds explaining the, for example, the IPEC event? Oh, sure. Because I think we are starting to do that, in fact. Yeah, so just quickly. Uh, I'm too close to this one. Um, <laughs> um, we, a few years ago, we did a big event with a room full of, um, it was an interprofessional education event at lunchtime for lots and lots of students. Um, there were probably 80 students in the room and we presented Martha as like a patient and then presented their wor her words and um, images of her books and her, her books there. Um, and had di had students dialogue like how would you deal with a patient coming into your your office and speaking to you like this like how does this make you feel how does this bring up things for you so we we are beginning those dialogues and I hope to infiltrate a little bit more um, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much.